I don't care what anyone tells me. The 2012 remake Red Dawn was a very good movie, just like its 1984 predecessor. So there, Red Dawn was a great movie, changed my mind. I also like the movies Olympus Has Fallen and Invasion USA, as well as the Homefront games, Call of Duty Modern Warfare games, and World in Conflict. So, you may be wondering, what do all these movies and games have to do with anything? Well, they're all fictional events which show a foreign attack on U.S. territory, something that nationalists have deemed completely impossible. The most iconic part of all of this is how unlikely it actually is. A massive nation bordered by allies to the north and to the south, the U.S. is almost comically difficult to attack. You can't, because the idea of a land war in North America isn't really feasible. Nobody wants to fight a land war, especially in a non-strategic area with no true purpose. In our timeline, if anything was going to have a conventional war, it was going to be in Europe, not in the heartland of the US. In fact, just by looking at a map, you can see that America has a big advantage. It's secured by two fairly sizable oceans, making it almost impossible to attack or invade. Hey guys, what's going on? This is Miniman here, and welcome back to another video. So, the United States is a very powerful country, and there's not much bias here. I know I am an American, but looking at the facts, it's probably the most powerful country in the world and here are six reasons why the United States will never be conquered. Their main arguments are that the US's geographical position as well as its powerful military would make any attack on the US completely unfeasible. However, these claims are easy to refute. First of all, in regards to the geographical position, there are multiple locations where the US could see a front pop up in the case that its allies were occupied or an enemy strike force makes a stealth attack. Modern technology has allowed people to master their grip over geography, and the US is not the only one that can achieve that. Now, an invasion by definition is simply an instance of invading a country or a region with an armed force. An invasion does not have to mean that an enemy will make an incursion to occupy certain territory or the entire country. An invasion could also mean that an enemy force makes an incursion to either gain a tactical advantage by committing sabotage or to demoralize the public on the home front. For example, during the Second World War, Nazi Germany invaded Canada during the Battle of the St. Lawrence. The invasion wasn't intended to occupy Canadian soil at all, but instead to choke the supply line of ships heading to the United Kingdom right at the source. The atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki were also partly intended to demoralize the Japanese government and make them surrender, not to occupy the nation by a takeover. And it is worth mentioning that the US can also be a victim to these kinds of invasions, because they have happened before. To point out, in my list, I won't be including the colonial wars in the US or the American Revolution or even the War of 1812, as these are pretty iconic fights on US soil. Let's shift off to the war that started on US soil, and it was the Mexican American War, which happened between 1846 and 1848. The war started with Mexicans advancing on May 3rd with the Siege of Fort Texas. It was a six day battle that ended with victory for the Americans. This was part of the entire Texas campaign that lasted until May 9th, 1846. This was part of the Texas campaign that lasted until May 9th, 1846 with the Battle of Palo Alto. After that, American forces pushed into Mexico to take certain parts of Mexican territory and place it as U.S. sovereign soil. The war ended in 1848 with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in victory for the Americans. The desire of the war was to crush the Texas Revolution and keep it as part of Mexico, but then again, it is a nation that borders the U.S., so it's pretty easy here. Now let's shift our attention to the Civil War. What many people don't know is that many European powers at the time actually supported the South because it was, it was their main exporter of cotton and they would much rather recognize a Confederate America than face a cotton shortage. The United Kingdom and France almost joined the South side after the Trent Affair. In 1861, Confederate diplomats were sailing on a British diplomatic ship, the RMS Trent, to London to gain support for the Civil War. However, on November 6th, a Union ship, the USS Jacinto, intercepted the ship and kept it hostage and removed the two Confederate diplomats. Holding a neutral ship hostage was in violation of international law, and this is where the British began planning invasion routes from Canada, as well as British and French ships bombing Union coastal fortifications and 
blockading their ports. The entire stage was set for the American Civil War to turn into World War I's bloody prequel. However, the Union apologized for the move and let the Trent move on. Britain and France backed off, and the idea of a Confederate America with some really powerful friends never materialized. The 20th century then was indeed a turning point in the way humans saw armed conflict, and indeed the U.S. was no exception. After their revolution in 1910, Mexico experienced two decades of wars and revolutions, some of which spilled over into the U.S. On March 9, 1916, a revolutionary general, Pancho Villa, started a raid on a U.S. border town of Columbus in New Mexico. The raid escalated into a full-scale battle between the Mexican revolutionaries and the U.S. Army troops that were stationed there, and it was originally intended to gain supplies from the U.S. to help the revolutionaries replenish their battle losses, but the fight got out of hand. Villa's forces were pushed back into Mexico, and, and President Wilson ordered the punitive expedition to capture the revolutionary generals. Although the attack dissuaded any other Mexican attacks on U.S. soil, the Americans were unsuccessful in catching Villa. This was the last time a U.S. city on the mainland was laid siege to by a foreign power. Now let's move on. When people think of World War I, they think of Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. Well, what if I told you that the U.S. also experienced a piece of the war on its own soil? On July 21st, 1918, German U-boat U-156 surfaced three miles off the town of Orleans in Massachusetts. The U-boat sunk the four barges and heavily damaged the tugboat, the Perth Amboy. While the crew sailed back to shore, the U-boat fired on the town for about an hour. It was believed that the attack was meant to destroy the communications center in the town that had transatlantic cables linked to Britain and France. Eventually, the townspeople noticed a battle was raging on their coast, and they called Chatham Naval Station, only 10 miles away. Two Curtis seaplanes were scrambled and fought off the U-boat with depth charges. The media dubbed this fight the Battle of Orleans, and while there were some injuries, there were no fatalities. This is the only instance that the Central Powers attacked U.S. soil during the First World War. The Roaring Twenties, though, was a moment of fun, fashion, and music, but it was also home to the Escobar Rebellion in Mexico between the government and a few deserting rebels. Patrick Murphy was an Irish mercenary who fought for the rebels, and between April 2nd and April 6th, 1929, he accidentally bombed the border town of Naco in Arizona. There were no casualties, but he did inflict some property damage. This was the first time that the U.S. was a victim to an air raid, but it would not be the last. This is what brings me to World War II. Now, everyone already knows the attack on Pearl Harbor, so I won't mention that, but Hawaii did see some land fighting after the attack. While the second wave of Japanese planes were returning to their aircraft carriers, a Japanese pilot named Shigenori Nishikaichi sorry if I pronounced that wrong, crash-landed on the island of Nihau, which was occupied by Hawaiian natives. When they heard about the attack on Pearl Harbor, they held the pilot captive and radioed Oahu to come and detain him. However, three residents of Japanese descent lived on the island and helped the downed pilot escape and gave him weapons, including the machine gun from his downed aircraft. The four Japanese took the islanders hostage while waiting for a Japanese rescue force. However, However, one of the islanders, Ben Kanahela, along with his wife Ella, overpowered the hostage takers, which led to the death of the pilot and a Japanese sympathizer commits suicide. The two remaining Japanese sympathizers were detained when the authorities arrived later on. Ben Kanahal received a medal for merit and a purple heart for what was known as the Nihau incident. The crashed airplane can be seen at the Pacific Aviation Museum in Hawaii today. Across the ocean, however, June 21, 1942 saw the only attack on a military installation on the U.S. mainland during World War II. Japanese submarine I-25 surfaced off the coast of Oregon where it fired at Fort Stevens, which housed coastal artillery. The attack did little damage and an A-29 Hudson bomber fought off the submarine with depth charges. Hi, I'm Dan Horn with Discerning History, and this is Battery Russell. Battery Russell is part of Fort Stevens, which was built during the Civil War. It was built to protect the mouth of the Columbia River. It's in Oregon, but its claim to fame isn't the fact that it was built during the Civil War. Its claim to fame is that it is the only military establishment in the continental United States that was fired on during World War II. 
With the bombing of Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, all of a sudden the United States felt vulnerable to attack. Before that, with the Pacific Ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, it was hard to see America being attacked. But once Hawaii was attacked, especially along the West Coast, people started to fear attack. So forts such as this one, Fort Stevens, were built up and were, were strengthened so that they'd be ready to defend off a Japanese invasion, which was believed that could happen at any time. As we look back and we look at the size of Japan and the size of their, their forces, it's kind of ridiculous to think of an invasion. But right after such a major attack and such a major loss of life, the people in North America could believe anything from the Japanese. This is the only military establishment that was actually attacked, however. The attack happened on the night of June 21st, 1942, just six or seven months after Pearl Harbor. That night, a Japanese sub appeared off the coast. It was I-25, a large Japanese submarine. It had almost 100 crewmen. It also had its own airplane. As large of a sub it was, it only carried one cannon, and that was a 14-centimeter cannon. It surfaced on the night of June 21st and started to bombard the fort. The fort had a decision to make. Does it fire back or does it just wait it out? It chose to wait it out, figuring that if it fired back, that would tell the sub exactly where its cannon were and so that they could target those cannon. So instead, they ordered a complete blackout. The bombardment consisted of 17 rounds. Most of those rounds didn't land anywhere near Fort Stevens. Most of them actually hit a baseball field, but a few did hit here near Battery Russell. But all the damage that they did was to some telephone lines. The only American response was by a plane that happened to be out on a training mission. It saw I-25 and dropped a few bombs, but I-25 was able to submerge and escape unscathed. The Japanese never launched a major invasion of the continental United States. I-25 ended up being sunk in 1943. But the real threat that had the American people on edge was the Aleutian Islands campaign. On June 3, 1942, Japanese troops occupied Atu and Kiska, two islands linked to the Alaskan coast. It, was, it is believed that the attack was intended to distract the U.S. from the Battle of Midway that same year. Dutch Harbor was bombed and battles were conducted in heavy snow which resulted in almost 6,000 deaths. The campaign ended on August 15, 1943 when the Japanese retreated. The Aleutians are a string of island bases extending over a thousand miles westward from the Alaskan Peninsula. These islands, the Japs once considered a back door to the United States. Who knows of that two island except a very small percentage of people in this world? I've mentioned the word, uh, you know, in conversation with people. Oh, it's on that two, that two island. Where is that? Nobody knows where that two island is. You know, you hear about soldiers coming home for, and having nightmares. The only nightmares I had was uh, people on fire. The inhuman sounds and screams that they made. When you use a flamethrower on somebody and they're on fire and they scream, it's inhuman. Here we are. This is the beach we landed on 60 years ago. Nazi Germany also scored some hits in North America. In July 1942, U-boat U-166 entered the Mississippi River with the intent of attacking oil tankers in the Gulf of Mexico. It was then destroyed by depth charges from a U.S. Coast Guard G-49 Widgeon and sunk with all hands lost. The wreck was discovered in 2001 and it is now protected as a war grave. Hitler's U-boats waste no time going on the attack. They brought the war to us in a way that caught us by surprise. The attacks are devastating. Thousands of lives lost. More ships sunk than at Pearl Harbor. 
and Nazi spies secretly delivered to American soil. The Cold War was a moment when Americans really wondered if the United States would be attacked by Soviet bombers and troops. I mean, if you've heard of the interstate and driven all over it, it was actually built in order for American troops to quickly respond to a Soviet invasion. One Soviet plan called for landing parachuters on the west coast to cause active, to cause active sabotage and distract the US from any potential war in Europe. Side note, this is actually referenced in the game World in Conflict, but the point is that this was easily achievable. Many people see the US and Russia as being half a world away when actually they are right next door neighbors and the Bering Strait was also a part of the Iron Curtain. All over Chukotka you had military bases set up such as a certain airfield that is now abandoned called Adelaide. It it would house Russian nuclear and conventional bombers, which would hit targets all over North America. Something to point out is that something like this actually did happen. And to explain what it was, I first have to respond to John Green. So the Cold War was a rivalry between the USSR and the USA that played out globally. But despite all the great spy novels and shaken, not stirred martinis, the Cold War never did heat up in Europe. Actually, John, the Cold War did briefly heat up in Europe a couple times. You had the Catalina Affair in June 1952 and the air battle over Merklin in March 1953. But it's also worth noting that the Cold War did heat up in North America too. On June 22, 1955, a U.S. Navy P-2V Neptune was patrolling the International Date Line where it was attacked by three Soviet MiG-15 fighter jets. After a brief air battle, the MiGs managed to shoot down the American plane and it crashed on St. Lawrence Island near the town of Gamble. The villagers rushed to help the crew, three of which were wounded in the air battle and four of which were injured in the crash. The Soviet government defended the attack by saying that it was the Americans who fired first and poor visibility made it impossible to determine what was going on. However, they expressed regret for the shooting and offered to pay half the amount of damages. This was the only time that the Cold War heated up in North America. It is also true that there were many moments where Soviet aircraft were intercepted near western borders and were in range of inhabited areas. Events like these persisted throughout the Cold War. U.S. fighter jets intercepted four Soviet bombers off Alaska earlier today. Photographs released this evening by the Pentagon give a hint, perhaps, of what the Soviets think of us these days. In the theater of post-Cold War warfare, U.S. strategic planners have been forced to contend with various possible threats from adversaries such as Russia or China. The U.S. still borders Russia through Alaska, and Chukotka still houses Russian military troops. To go into further detail, the Diomede Islands are only a few kilometers away from each other. Small Diomede is one of America's most remote settlements. It has no internet or landlines, and the only forms of communication it has are from a satellite phone and a mail helicopter. Yes, Diomede is the only place in the U.S. where mail is delivered by helicopter. Big Diomede, on the other hand, which is in Russia's territory, has a military base where FSO troops are stationed, and technically, if they wanted to, they could occupy small Diomede, and it would be a while before the Americans would even know that the place was occupied. In the event Russia and the US go to war with each other in Europe or the Middle East, the Russians could easily open up an American front by invading Alaska. And why would they invade Alaska, you may ask? Well, Alaska is home to many northern military bases, a major missile defense base, and more importantly, it has remote radar stations which detect ICBMs. From there, they could even attack Canadian Forces Base Alert, and North America would have a much harder time detecting missiles going over the Arctic. U.S. commanders are also aware of this, and it's not an impossible scenario like nationalists claim. The head of NORAD, the North American Aerospace Defense Command, warning a new generation of Russian cruise missiles could strike critical military radars and missiles inside the United States. The development of the cruise missiles that they have, that have a very long range, that from, uh, from the Russian, from eastern Russia, they can range critical infrastructure in Alaska and in Canada that we rely on for a homeland defense mission. 
Ever since 2014, there have been hundreds, and I mean literally hundreds, of air intercept incidents with Russian aircraft all over Europe and North America. They've been intercepted only a few kilometers off Alaska, California, Washington DC, and even New York. If they really wanted to, they could strike areas in the mainland, and bombers would definitely go with fighter escorts in the case of an armed conflict. China is also very capable too. In 2015, while participating in war games with the Russians, a few Chinese warships entered U.S. coastal waters off Alaska and were within striking distance of the mainland. On July 2018, a Chinese destroyer conducted espionage acts off the coast of Hawaii. This was a type 815 Don Diego class ship, and if it really wanted to, it could strike military bases and radar stations on Oahu to cripple military activity in the Pacific. One new theater of war that many people, one new theater of war that many people don't know about but is very devastating is cyber warfare. As a developed nation, the US is heavily reliant on electricity and the internet. What makes the concept of cyber attacks terrifying is that you don't need to have a powerful army to do serious damage, which means that even hackers from Iran or North Korea could inflict heavy casualties all at the press of a button on a laptop. They could disrupt banking systems, defense industries, telecommunication systems, power grids, utility controls, air traffic, and even many energy facilities which could have devastating effects. Worst of all, they could pave the way for an invasion. Okay, so this video isn't meant to poke fun at the US's vulnerable parts. I want to finally show nationalists about the danger that could happen so that better steps could be taken to prevent them in the first place. Admiral Husband Kimmel even said that a smart enemy hits you exactly where you think you're safe. All these preparations are necessary so that no surprises can come up, whether it is in Europe or in North America.